Well, good evening. Uh, I want to welcome you all to a conversation with Margaret Sullivan, who is the media columnist with the Washington Post. She describes her position as one that involves writing about the news media, press rights, and the digital transformation of the culture. Before working for the Post, she held the position as the New York Times public editor, in effect, a reader representative, and reported directly to the publisher, Arthur Sulzberger Jr. And previously, she led the Buffalo News, a 200-member newsroom, as its editor and vice president, having started out as an intern at the newspaper itself. So she has a, a variety of experiences from the ground up at local news to the national media as well. She did her BA at Georgetown in English and her master's at Northwestern in journalism. Before we start, I also want to acknowledge the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation for underwriting our conversation about ethics in the time of confrontation. So, and I want to thank the support uh, of the Journalism and Mass Communications Department as well. So after our conversation, we will save some time for the audience to ask questions. But to start, I have a fairly basic question, and that is, how do you see your purpose as a media columnist? First of all, thank you so much for having me. This is uh, my first trip to the Shenandoah Valley, and it's gorgeous, and your campus is wonderful. So thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, well, you know, when I, when I initially um, tried to get my job at the Washington Post, I modeled it in a way after a very, very well thought of and revered, but unfortunately uh, deceased um, media columnist at the New York Times, David Carr. And I had admired his work a lot uh, at the Times, and I, I thought that it might be a good kind of role for the Washington Post to have as well. So it, it isn't really a media critic, um, although I do some media criticism, but it, it actually tries to take issues that have to do with the news media and explain them or expound on them in some way. Um, I thought when I came to the Post in 2016 that I would be writing a lot about, um, you know, what part of what you described, the sort of digital transformation of the news industry, and I really thought that would be a major focus of what I was doing, what was happening with Facebook and how local news was under siege and newspapers were closing and all this sort of thing. But then, uh, well, something happened, and the thing that happened was, um, well, I, one of my first assignments was to cover both of the political conventions um, in, in 2016. And from then, I think some incredibly high proportion of my columns have been about one Donald Trump. Um, because Trump has so um, made the, his relationship with the news media such a focal point of what he's done, and it's become such a big story that it's been impossible to avoid it uh, as, as a part of kind of the media columnist um, beat, if you will. So my job is to, is to write a column so I, there is opinion in my work uh, or perspective. And so uh, I was saying to a, a class earlier that I sometimes am challenged by, by readers who say, um, I, I think it's terrible the way you put opinion in your work. And I write back to them and say, well, you see, I'm a columnist. And so it's part of the job description. So I try to write about the news media with opinion and with perspective, uh, but hopefully with some good sense as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you noted that they call it perspective. So why do they call it perspective? And why are you in the style section of the Washington <laughs> Post, which seems an odd place instead of the op-ed, for example? Right. Well, I'm, you know, as many of you know, um, there's a a sharp dividing line in, in news organizations or certainly in newspapers between the opinion side and the news side. And I'm in sort of a peculiar situation because I'm on the news side. I, I don't work for the opinion section. I don't work for the op-ed page or the editorial page. Um, I work for Marty Barron, who, who is in charge of news coverage, but I do write an opinion column. And there are others of us who, 
who do the same. As far as why it's in the style section, I know that might make people think that it's about fashion or uh, you know, something kind of frivolous. <laughs> but it's the style section is where our culture coverage and our media coverage has always resided. So in that sense, it makes some sense, I think. OK. So how would you differentiate yourself from another writer like Paul Farhi, who mm -hmm. covers the media, or any of the others? How do you identify your place in that particular spectrum? So Paul and I are, are close colleagues. And he is essentially a, a news a news feature writer who writes about media but without opinion in it. And mine is the role of a columnist. So I suppose it's sort of the difference between straight news writing and column writing. And you know, I mean, it is a little confusing, too, because the Post also has a writer whose name is Eric Wemple, mm -hmm. who writes about the media. But he is an opinion writer who actually does work you know, for the opinion side of the operation. So we really don't consult with him, what are you doing and what am I doing? We don't try to sort of straighten it out. We just go our separate ways. And if we overlap, oh well. OK. Uh, let me ask you this. In these confrontational times, how does journalism find an ethical way to confront unethical behavior? Well, I mean, the, uh, what we need to do is to stick with the truth as closely as we can and to explain ourselves to the public as much as we can, and to try not to get drawn into the deeply polarized situation that seems to get worse every day. And it's, it's really challenging. People have such strong feelings about what's going on. They've got their minds made up often by the time they come to, um, to, come to news coverage or come to an opinion story. So um, I think the role of journalists, whether they're news writers or opinion writers, is to try to stay with the facts, um, try to explain ourselves as much as possible, and you know, cover the news and, and, and cover it fairly. So I can cover it with some opinion worked into it, but I think we still need to you know, sort of hew to what's real and what's actually provable and verifiable. So how's that working? What's the reaction? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really tough out there right now. Um, you know, I'm somebody who I was explaining to students earlier. You know, I really come out of local journalism. I was at the Buffalo News for many years, from summer intern to editor of the paper, and had many, many jobs there. But the thing that I always did and always prided myself on was responding to any letter that was written to me, any email. Um, you know, returned my phone calls, always tried to communicate with readers. And um, I did, of course, when I was at the New York Times, I was the reader's representative, so it was really my job to communicate with readers. And, and so I pride myself on that, but it's gotten to be a much more difficult thing in the past few years because the, the, the you know, I'm immersed in politics, I'm immersed in national politics at a very fraught time, and I've I've really received scary email. I've I've received uh, you know death threats. I've had a lot of misogynistic and other um, abusive kinds of correspondence with readers. Some of which I've had to send to the security department at the Post because I felt like they were you know potentially dangerous. Um, and I do draw the line there. I don't answer those people. And, I don't th and in fact, the folks at the Post who are experts in this tell us not to engage when it sounds like it's something you know, that's off the charts. But if people write to me with a concern or they say, I disagree with you and here's why, I, t I tend to answer them. Um, but it's gotten to be much, much more difficult. People are really in their corners now. And I wonder if there's even a way to persuade or to, you know, to listen. Uh, every once in a while, I'll have a back and forth with a reader that ends with both of us feeling like we learned something and we're happy, and that's a cause of celebration. But it's become relatively rare. So how do you deal with that? I mean, as a professional, you, you have to be aware that people are going to have differences with you and, in fact, can be very antagonistic. But as a person, there is another side to that as well. And so how do I how deal, do with, deal it with it as a person? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I go to yoga. I mean, I really <laughs> do. I go to yoga, and I meditate, and I, I read fiction. 
and I try to get away from it as much as possible just to stay sane. Yeah. Um, because, you know, these days I'm on um, social media all the time. I'm, I get a lot of email. Um, there's so much news to keep up with that you can get very, very immersed in it. And so it's, I find that it's really important to, to kind of draw a line at some point. I mean, you know, these days, these couple of days that I'm down here are a fantastic break from, I mean, I'm not planning to write any columns while I'm down here, and just the knowledge of that and being able to have conversations, talk to students, hear what that's on their mind is a great way to kind of get away from the fray a little bit. So what kind of fiction do you read to get away from the world of reality? Well, uh, right now I'm reading short stories written by Zadie Smith, who's a favorite novelist of mine, and these are her first short stories. But um, I'm also, this is not fiction, but I'm reading Robert Caro's book called Working. Uh, so Robert Caro is the biographer of LBJ and, um, and of Robert Moses, and you know has written these long, masterful books. But this book is sort of a, a little mini memoir of how he does his work. And uh, I've been fascinated by that. So, but then also, and this is sort of quirky, but I, um, I just reread The Hobbit. Um, <laughs> and that, you know, there were no cell phones then in, in Middle Earth. So that was sort of, that was very nice to be able to just sort of truly get away from that. And I have no idea why I picked that up but, and reread it, but I, it, was, it was a nice break. Do you think the Lord of the Rings might be too close to what we're dealing with what, today? What's the Lord of the Rings, yes. <laughs> yes, we're in Mordor, I think. Um. All right. In one of your columns, uh, you noted that the mainstream media seems to have quietly removed its Trump normalizing gloves. And, and you cited Peter Baker, who was here last week, mm. also uh, speaking to us, uh, the New York Times, and in his piece, The White House Memo. And you also mentioned Nate Silver, editor of the 538.com, noting, I do think a corner has been turned uh, in the way he's being covered. But you ended the column not as optimistically as you reported it in a way. And you said, quote, if that's changing now, as I think it is, the question hangs in the fetid air. How much damage already has been done? Why did you end it that way? Well, you know, I think we've, as, as media people, as press people and journalists, I think we've had a really hard time figuring out how to cover President Trump and, and before that, candidate Trump, because he is um, very skilled at sort of uh, pulling our attention in sometimes to things that are distracting or not particularly uplifting or important. And, and you know, he also, you know, makes a lot of false statements. And so we haven't really figured out how to cover him. We want to cover him like he's a president like uh, George H.W. Bush, for example, or, you know, Jimmy Carter. But he's not a president like that. He's a, he's a completely different kind of character, and we really want to, we seem to want to fit him into an old mold, even though he has broken that mold. And I think it's only now that we've kind of begun to figure out how to tell it a little bit more directly. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know how, you know, one of the students asked me today when when things are eventually over uh, in the Trump administration, whether that's sooner or much, much later, will we go back to the way things were? And I don't think that we do. I think things have really, really changed in the media world um, to the point where they won't simply revert. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the press conferences that don't happen, that used to be pretty regular, uh, right. and the way that President Trump actually deals with this by standing on a driveway and letting people ask questions. Is that change that's taken place something that might be better or worse in the long run, in your view, for how you cover the president? Well, I think that the daily briefings that used to take place in the press room were very useful for citizens. I mean, it was a way for journalists to talk to the president's representative, his press secretary, and ask questions that were important to the public. We don't have that opportunity anymore. Now, President Trump is actually quite accessible to the press, but it's sort of on his terms. Um, you know, standing outside the helicopter with the chopper blades going and, and being able to, you know, field a couple questions 
but not really be held to account in the same way. So there is, you know, he likes to talk to the press and he is more accessible in some ways than others, but not necessarily in a way that helps us do our jobs. And I don't mean make it easy for us to do our jobs, but to do our jobs on behalf of the public. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I think that the demise of, you know, it's now been six months or something since the last briefing. They used to be right. pretty much daily. And I think that is a loss. I think it's a real loss to the public. Okay. Do you think, too, that in, in dealing with the way that it's been working, that we are, and you sort of mentioned this before, but are we moving toward an opportunity to do things differently in a way that might be more beneficial, or are we losing the opportunity, period? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd, I don't know how it can be an improvement not to have, you know, regular contact with the president's <clears throat> um, uh, representative who can answer questions. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't see that as a positive thing. Good. But perhaps it's positive that we're, you know, coming to terms with the situation we have and figuring out how to go forward from here. Um, you know, it's 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 very it's very disheartening to see the you know certainly you know the other day when the president attended the nationals game um, and he was booed you know I saw people saying well that's you know democracy in action and I suppose it is in a way people can say what they want to say but it's still you know I could not you know I found it really tough to see um, so you know we're in a pretty ugly time. Mm -hmm. And I feel that personally, and I think we see it every day. Yeah. One of the things that I think we think is important are facts, that we're able to have Facts them. are definitely important. And, and with you, you there. And you noted that, that a news report can be narrowly factual and still plenty unfair. And this was about Elizabeth Warren, mm. and a story was done about that. Could you sort of say what you mean and how do consumers are going to be able to distinguish in that situation? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's possible to write a story that has all the facts right but still misleads you. Um, you know, I think this, the specific thing that I was talking about, and you know, we may have very strong feelings about this, but um, was, oh, oh, this was about how she was, how she was smeared. In she was smeared because she oh. was told she, she had to leave her job because she got pregnant and. Right, okay. So, um, someone who worked for a pretty conservative, a really right-wing uh, news organization wrote a piece, you know, Elizabeth Warren has made it a, a regular part of her campaign speech to talk about how um, she was a teacher. And when she got pregnant, and this was in the 60s or early 70s, early 70s, I guess, that she was essentially fired and that was the end of her teaching career. And she, you know, she talks about this as a way to make herself relatable in these in these um, campaign talks. So uh, this reporter digs up some documentation that shows that, in fact, she was offered her job again. I mean, she's got the documentation that shows she wasn't fired. She, here's it, it says right here she was, she was offered the job again and wrote a story about it that, in fact, was narrowly factual but misleading because, as it turns out, she was offered that job again, but that was when she was pregnant, but not yet showing. And at that time, you know, a couple months later, when she was showing, um, she, you know, the school superintendent called her in and said, you know, we've replaced you and have a nice life. And so um, you, while it was true that she was offered the job again, while it was true that she resigned, um, you know, with nice words from all, it was still the case, and I think that the, the chronology shows that you know, her story was true, and yet it was sort of put out there that she had lied about it, and I don't think there's any reason to think that she had lied about it. So in a way, I guess what I'm hearing is that in addition to the facts, there needs to be context to what took place so exactly. that people can understand why those facts were the way they are. Right, but I think mm -hmm. in this case, Elizabeth Warren made a huge blunder because mm -hmm. the reporter um, did go to her and to her campaign and say, you know, we've got this documentation, what gives here? And now I don't know how much time they gave her to respond, but the story that this woman wrote said that they didn't respond. 
Well, if she had responded and told exactly that in the response, that would have cleared up a lot of a lot of the the problem. But she didn't respond, and so I think she you know she has to bear some of the responsibility for the early part of that story, which you know spread very widely. Okay. In another column, it was noted with the headline for your column says that with impeachment looming, the news media is growing a spine. It needs stiffening. Mm. Could you say more about why it needed to have stiffening and in what way should it stiffen? Yeah. So I think that, I mean, this is opinion on my part, but I think that we've been, we've uh, in general, although many people will say, oh, the media is out to get President Trump, at the same time, we've really let our coverage be dictated by how the president wants to distract us tweet about something, um, et cetera. I think that now that the country is starting, starting to grapple with the idea of, gee, maybe there are actual grounds for impeachment here. Some people think that, not everybody does. Um, I think that they're, we're starting to push back a little bit and stay a little more focused and not get as distracted. And he okay. is certainly masterful at, you know, sort of, here's the shiny object over here, mm -hmm. so let's all run over there. Okay. In another time, you mentioned that the attacks that Trumps have made on the news media is not going to make much difference in the media industry itself or individual journalists. And why not? Well, I'm not sure I still think that. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm allowed to change my mind, I guess. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, President Trump has said many times that the news media is the enemy of the American people, and he refers to reporters as scum and um, that they're very dishonest. And of course, he essentially popularized this phrase, fake news. And so now, you know, legitimate reality-based reporters are out there in the world trying to do their jobs, and people will say, you're nothing but fake news. And I think that's, I do actually think that damage has been, has been done there. I have a colleague, a former colleague from Buffalo, his name is Jerry Zaremski, and Jerry is the Buffalo News's Washington correspondent. So he wrote stories early mm -hmm. on about Representative Chris Collins, who um, was on the board of a company and eventually was uh, accused of and now has been convicted of insider trading. Um, and while Jerry was writing these stories, but before, before Collins was indicted and before he was convicted, um, Collins was actually doing uh, fundraising emails in which he was saying the Buffalo News and Jerry Zaremski are, they are fake news. Well, there was nothing fake about what Jerry was reporting as has now been proven out, you know, through the legal process. But that's a really very difficult thing to hear as a reporter who's trying to do their job. And also, I think it does harm you know, we all know that, I hope we know, that the press is one of the, one of the foundations of our democracy. And so when you allow this idea to circulate that it's all a bunch of lies and don't believe it and people, they're all dishonest, I think it actually does do harm. So I don't know when I said that, but I've changed my mind. Okay, and, and do you think historically that we are that much different with the public some of the public thinking, uh, not well of the press since the outset of our country and even quite before that. Mm. Is, is there any difference that you can see that's significant or is this part of like a wave that goes up and down yeah. at different times in history? No, I think, I think we're in a different era now. Um, we were talking in class earlier about how the, you know, there's deep distrust and mistrust of the news media right now and that's, that's very unfortunate. Some of it may be earned, but it's, it is very unfortunate. The, the height of trusting the public, trusting the press was right after Watergate and what, right after the Pentagon Papers when there was a feeling that the press is doing its job of being government watchdogs and holding the powerful accountable. Um, and that's an important, important role. Um, at that time, you know, approval of the press, or at least trust of the press, was something like 70%. Well, it's down in the 30s now. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a very troubling thing. Can that ever be regained? You know, I, I, I don't know that it can. 
And I think people have their minds made up about this, and and it's um, it's a really tough thing. And for someone like me who's devoted uh, an entire career to it and really believes in the principles of it and the good that can be done, it's um, it's very very discouraging to see you know a lot of ordinary people, uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way, just sort of regular citizens, I guess, uh, American citizens you know, approaching the mainstream press with such um, immediate disdain. So saying that, what kind of hope can we have, those of us who dedicate our lives to journalism and those who teach it and those who have been involved and those young people who are interested in following on that path, what do you see will be necessary to sustain us and to push us in that direction? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one interesting thing is that local news is still pretty well regarded. Um, it's, it's people trust their local newspaper, they trust their local TV stations, you know, and so I think we need to make sure that local journalism stays in business and it's mm -hmm. really threatened right now. So that's, that's an area that I think we can emphasize. And I also think that we need to continue to do our jobs as journalists and explain ourselves as much as we can to people, but stay, you know, sort of nose to the grindstone and, and do the reporting that is our mission. And in a way, you have to kind of let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still extremely important work. It's still very gratifying work when it's done right. And, um, you know, I don't think there's a reason to give up on it. It's just that I don't know that we're going to turn people around. Okay. Well, you did focus, and you have on local and smaller news outlets. In one of your columns, you talked about the Center for Investigative Journalism in Puerto Rico mm. and the kind of work that they did to basically unseat through the public, not themselves, but the information that brought down a governor there. And uh, I have to say, I have to ethically disclose, I'm from Puerto Rico, so I was very interested in that mm -hmm. column. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what, if you could explain a little bit why you wanted to highlight that particular Effort. Right. Well, you know, one of the things that's cropped up in the new journalism world are nonprofit news organizations that are all digital, um, usually funded through philanthropy or gifts or grants of some kind. And that is true of this small but powerhouse uh, Puerto Rican um, news organization. And you know, the they got a, if I remember the 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 uh, facts of the situation. They got a hold of these, this whole uh, huge amount of text messages right. between the governor and his cronies that showed that how corrupt the whole situation was. And the, for one thing, the very disparaging things they had said about their own citizens in the wake of Hurricane Maria, um, you know, making jokes about piles of dead bodies and you know, just horrible things. So the news organization gets this cache of. Um, of text messages and you know does stories about them and publishes some of the text messages and you know people the citizens who already were not too fond of the governor you know found this completely enraging and were out in the streets protesting and you know hundreds of thousands of people I think and he really had no choice but to step down. So it was an ama amazing um, sort of coming together of the role of the press, informing citizens, and citizens, you know, taking things into their own hands, and and causing, you know, causing change. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they're a they're a small startup organization that you know operates on a shoestring. So right. the the fact that they were able to do the work they did was really very commendable. Going on that theme, you're ready to book on local news. Would you like to tell us something about that, what prompted it, and mm -hmm. what you're hoping people will learn from reading it? Sure. So um, yes, I'm writing what I'm calling my starter book. I've never written a book before. And this book is a, a short, it's novella length, but it's nonfiction. And it's, it's for Columbia University's uh, press called Columbia Global Reports. And it basically looks at what's happening in local news, which is really discouraging. Um, you know, 2,100 uh, newspapers, dailies and weeklies, have gone out of business in a, the past 10 years. Newsroom employment is down by half. Um, you know, and yet Pew Research did a study recently in which they asked people, you know, how do you think local news is doing? And most people said it's doing fine. 
but it's not doing fine. These news organizations are really in trouble, and many of them are going away. Um, you know, it, it's 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 very discouraging. I mean, my own old newsroom, the Buffalo News, has had to cut its newsroom staff back by more than half, and they are actually more stable than most. So I was telling the students today about the situation in Denver. So Denver used to have two big newspapers, the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. And they each had 300 journalists in their newsroom. And that's you know, a good hefty amount of people to cover. They really covered the whole state. Well, the Rocky Mountain News is now shuttered. It's out of business. So that's 300 people gone. And the Denver Post is owned by essentially by a hedge fund, which is only oriented towards profit. And their newsroom is down to under 60 people. So they've gone from 600 people in their newsroom down to 60. And you know this is happening all over the country, but I don't think people are very aware of it. So um, you know, because local news is more trusted, because it's so necessary, um, and because it's in such trouble, the book is kind of trying to inform people and, and sound the alarm to some extent. Do you see a role for people who like to follow the news, read the news, watch it, within regard to how the journalism works. What, what role does the consumer have in what we do? So I'm not sure I understand. Can they, can they help guide it? or can they, can they be playing a role in mm. some way that helps the news media do its job? Well, I mean, one way they can help us do our job is by, is by subscribing and reading and um, you know, supporting, I mean, the other part of that Pew study was not only that people thought local journalism was doing well, but they, that most people, very few, I think it was only one in four, ever paid anything for local news. So it's like, we think you're fine and we're not going to pay. So it really needs to be the opposite of that. Know how threatened it is. I mean, Warren Buffett, who owns the Buffalo News, um, has said that local newspapers have gone from being a monopoly to a franchise to, and then he sort of paused and said, well, they're basically toast. In other words, they're done. And Dean Becquet, the editor of the New York Times, has predicted that local newspapers, almost all local newspapers, will be gone in five to 10 years. I mean, I don't think we really have grappled with this. Mm -hmm. So I think the way citizens can help is by subscribing, uh, perhaps contributing to these new startup uh, organizations, and also by, I hope, by trying to, when their neighbors or friends start talking about, oh, it's all fake news, maybe stopping to um, push back a little bit and to talk about the role of the press in our democracy. Do you think that the fact-checking movement in journalism has been helpful and will be a factor in helping people believe more strongly in what journalism does? I mean, I think it's necessary, but I actually don't think it really will make much of a difference. I mean, we need to fact check. We certainly need to fact check right now. And it's good that we do more of that in real time. It's good that you know, you'll see on cable news, there'll be these things at the bottom, these chirons that say, actually, that is not true. Um, but do I think it's going to turn people around or really make a difference? Not really. I mean, Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post has documented some 10,000 false statements or lies uh, of President Trump's, but I don't think it's changed his behavior, and I don't think it's changed the way Democrats feel about him, and I don't think it's the way it's changed the way Republicans feel about him or the way his base feels about him. I just don't think it actually changes people's minds. But at the same time, I think it's useful and good to do. I mean, it's just it doesn't it doesn't turn anything around. Do you have any concern about opinions creeping into news stories? Have you seen that, and, and what's your yeah. view of that? Yes, I, I do have concerns about it. I, I think one of the reasons that people are so turned off to the press is that they see a blending of news and opinion. And they think, you know, they think, well, whatever happened to, you know, just the facts? And whatever happened to sort of Walter Cronkite? You know, this is, I'll hear this from people a lot. Why now do we have um, so much, why is everybody writing these hot takes? And why is it all opinion? And why is it all so vicious. 
I, and I think there is I think there is a problem there. I think we do need to keep news and opinion more separate, and we also need to do a better job of labeling it. I mean, in the old days, you would read the newspaper and you knew the difference between a news story on the front page and an editorial on the opinion page. But now that we're receiving news often through social media or on our phones, everything kind of feels the same. And so I think we have to do a better job of, you know, one, keeping opinion out of news stories while still providing context and providing analysis. I mean, I think Peter Baker does a great job with that, and he's mm -hmm. a straight news reporter. Um, and at the same time, labeling it opinion if that's what it is. So that can be helpful. And I do think that that's one of the reasons that people are so down on the whole thing. So what's your biggest hope for the future with regard to journalism so we could see it in a more positive light? Well, I mean, I hope that journalism endures, and I hope that it, I hope local journalism endures, and I hope that people, um, I hope that citizens can understand the role that it plays in society. I think that, that you know, it's unfortunate that there isn't more education about it in middle school and grade school and, and throughout um, our, our educational system about about that, about mm -hmm. the role of the press in society, and about how it works. I think that would be, I think media literacy is a really vital part of helping this whole thing along. But you know, you do that one person at a time, or you can have a class in it, but it doesn't really matter. I think it's great to see young journalists. I, I love talking to young journalists because I feel like they are our hope and our future, so yay. Um, and uh, you know, I just I just hope that it can continue, even though the whole system has been so disrupted by the internet. The internet has done a lot of great things for journalism too, which is that it makes our work available worldwide. Um, that's a great thing. I mean, in the old days, it's like whoever was in your newspaper circulation area was going to see your story. Now it could be someone anywhere. So that part is good but the disruption of the business model, and there's no answer to that, um, is, is really bad. And you know, I often have people tell me, well, the reason that, the, that newspapers are going out of business is you guys do a bad job. Well, that actually is not what it's about. It's about the fact that the internet came along and print advertising, classified advertising, went to Craigslist. Print advertising, for many reasons, went in all kinds of different directions, and the business model which was based on advertising has gone away. Now the New York Times and I, some other newspapers, I'm not sure where the post is on this, but the Times now gets more of its revenue from subscriptions than it does from advertising. And that is a big milestone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are some good trends. Yeah. Okay, a few. Great. Well, why don't we get some questions from the audience? Um, Ask me hard questions. Two, two mics here that are available. So raise your hand and someone will come to you. Somebody right here. Uh, this lady. Well, I want to say thank you. And I am a huge fan of print newspapers. And thank I you. actually pay for and subscribe to and read for every day. Oh. Wow. However, I have That's some great. pretty strong opinions. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> You're allowed. <laughs> about the things that I think maybe could help. So looking at the press briefings, because I watch them, mm -hmm. it's pretty much watching a Congress congressional hearing. It's pretty much worthless because the reporters seem to be trying to skewer whoever they were um, questioning to try to get them to say something that would support their the, the reporters um, need to write a story about it this way. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed really, really difficult. I hate watching the congressional hearings for the same reason. It's somebody trying to say what I believe instead of trying to find out news. Mm -hmm. um, and the other one um, that I feel kind of really passionate about, because it happens so often, um, is the old who, what, when, why, where. You could read the first five paragraphs of a news story and you'd know exactly what happened. Now, if you deign to read on the fifth page of what was on the first page, you might actually find the facts at the very end. And that's what bothers you, mm -hmm. because you can't, you, 
you know, if you will do that, then you can find out the reality of it. The, the facts are there, but mm -hmm. it's the way the stories are written mm -hmm. that make you just crazy mm -hmm. about trying to figure it out. Yeah, so. I do think, I mean, addressing your second point, I think we have gone way too far in the direction of indirect, um, you know, ways of getting into stories through anecdote or through analysis or something. And sometimes I'm like, wow, this is a interesting story they're telling here, but I'd actually like to know what the meat of it is. And you're right, sometimes you have to go to the jump page to find out, and that's very frustrating. I think, you know, there's so much, there's so much now, the news is already out there. It's out there on the internet, it's out there on social media. So I think that reporters feel they need to provide something, you know, different, and this is the different that they, that they come up with. Um, I think if you had a whole newspaper uh, or website or whatever it may be full of um, the kind of thing you're describing, which is just the, just the facts, like sort of like the way the Associated Press would write it, um, I'm not sure that would be the most, the, the absolute best way to present things these days. But I agree with you that we've probably gone too far in the direction of, you know, cutesy, long-winded, uh, anecdotal leads and so on. Um, you know, and as far as the, the, the press, you know, the way the press asks questions, I mean, I understand what you're saying. I, I think there's some grandstanding sometimes and some, you know, I don't like gotcha questions. And, uh, but what happens is if you ask things very politely and in a sort of shy, diffident way, um, you're, you can allow the person to sort of go off on their speech or their tangent and never get to the news that you're trying to, to, to get to. I thought that, uh, I don't know if you were aware of this, but um, Jeff Mason, who is a uh, Reuters reporter, was interviewing the president during his joint press conference with um, one other, with another foreign lead, oh, with the Ukrainian president. And Mason ha had, Mason had his question that he wanted to ask, and he was very, very polite. He never got crazy about it, but he kept asking it. And President Trump said to him, why don't you ask this guy a question, you know, meaning the Ukrainian president. He said, I do have a question for him, President Trump, but I, I'm actually trying to give you an opportunity to answer the question that I have for you. So he was very persistent, but very polite, and it was just a great model for how to do it. Somebody else wants to ask a question? Yeah, um, you referred to President Trump a couple times as a skilled. Uh, is the mic on? Is it on? Oh, you you re, you uh, referred to President Trump a couple of times as a skilled communicator. Skilled is is he really skilled or is he just a practiced narcissist sociopath? I mean, I was trying to be I was and, trying and, to be and very there is, tactful. There is a difference. <laughs> I mean, you know. I'm not sure that he's the master strategist of media that some people think he is. I think that he's very, very good at providing distraction. Um, and, you know, he is mesmerizing in a way. If you ever see, um, you know, him at a rally or something, I mean, it is kind of, you know, I think he is a, he, he's a, a, a very compelling um, speaker. I'm not saying I like what comes out of his mouth. I often don't. But I think he, he's, you know, he's, he's very skilled at commanding attention. Um, you know, I, I try not to go to um, analyzing him, uh, you know, in terms of narcissism or his mental health or any of that. I mean, I know people do that. I, I try not to, I mean, I may have my own thoughts about that, but I try not to, to go there too much, but rather to sort of stay with what is being said and, and what can be proven. So what has been the biggest setback of your career that you've had to overcome? That's a great question. Um, well, I had a really tough thing happen to me in Buffalo um, as editor. So I'm the top editor of the paper. And we had had a, uh, a horrible shooting at a restaurant. And um, no one knew who the shooter was. The shoot their shooter wasn't 
you know, found or killed or anything like that. But several people died, and um, and it was at a wedding reception, and everyone involved was um, African American. Uh, you know, all the all the people at the wedding reception, and they were local people in Buffalo, and. Um, you know, we were, over the days that we were covering it, we were trying to sort of figure out the mystery of who, of what had happened. And our police reporters got a hold of some um, information about the victims, those who had been injured and those who had died. And it showed that the victims had, um, had arrests, felony, several felony arrests that all, many of them had, you know, felony drug convictions and, and other kinds of things, you know, firearms and other kinds of things like that. So we wrote a story about it, and we played it prominently on the front page. And the African-American community in Buffalo was very, very upset with us because they felt like we, although everything was factual in it, um, they felt that it was kind of victim blaming. And I think, in retrospect, they were right. Um, I think that we gave it, I'm not saying that information shouldn't have been in a story, but we gave it too much emphasis. So there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of disruption and a lot of protests and so on. And I uh, called a African American minister who I knew pretty well and I said, you know, I'd like to talk to the community about it. You know, do you, could I come out and talk to your parish or your congregation. And he said, yes, that would be great. He'd appreciate it. So I went out to True Bethel Baptist Church in Buffalo, and um, I was expecting to maybe sit around a table with you know, 12 people or something like that. But when I got there, there were 700 people. And I stood at the podium and sort of took a lot of criticism for hours. Um, very, and it was sort of every complaint that the community had with the paper from before I was born, um, you know, about our coverage and and you know everything else, and the very very raw feelings about this um, shooting that had happened, and you know, I do feel that I wrote a story about this for Neiman Reports about um, you know how we as a newsroom and how I as an editor reacted to it. I wrote a column about it, you know, talking about how affected I was by what I heard. We we ended up doing a lot of training of people in the newsroom on diversity issues. We we did more coverage of the community in a different way than we had done. So we really changed how we were doing business. But um, it, you know, it was a it was a very contentious and very personally upsetting. And I will say, you know, I guess. Um, you look at this, you know, I don't know what it is now, 10 years later. Um, it was certainly very growth producing for me, but in an extremely, extremely difficult way. So I'd call that, you know, I think that measures up to what you asked about. <laughs> but you know what, there have been, I mean, I've been in the business for more than 30 years now, and it's, I've had, I've had, you know, mistakes in stories that were very upsetting you know, legitimate mistakes and stories. I've made bad decisions as an editor. You know, uh, when I was the public editor of the New York Times, there are things that I wrote about that I would do differently now. You know, you're, you're under the gun. You're usually on deadline. You are doing the best you can under stressful situation. And it's, you know, someone calls journal someone called journalism the first draft of history. You're you're doing it on the fly in many cases, or trying to not do it on the fly, but sometimes you, you have to make decisions. And they're not always the right decisions. And I think the thing to do is to try to, to learn from it and to fess up when you get it wrong. Somebody else? No, no. no. Um, if you Google um, the freedom of speech, um, United States ranking, Wiki Wikipedia shows this country as 34th amongst, or 35th amongst nations, 200 nations of the world. And um, if you look on the United Nations website, it ranks the United States as 45th. 
I just wonder if you have any ideas about why this country should rank not higher on the, on the rate rank. So thank you. Um, yes, that's, I mean, I don't know that your numbers are uh, exactly right, but I, I trust you. Um, uh, trust but verify is what we say in our business. Um, one thing that's happened is that that ranking has gone down in recent years. And, you know, uh, we no longer are the beacon for free speech and free expression and press rights that we should be. And, you know, I think that the disparagement of the press by the president is, is a part of that. Um, I will also tell you, though, that under President Obama, um, there was some, I think, very unfortunate treatment of the news media by trying to compel testimony um, in, in court cases. Um, you know, there's a reporter at the New York Times, James Risen, whose life was made quite miserable for many years because he didn't want to give up or to give any information about a confidential source of his, and the government was trying very hard to get him to do it, even though there are some protections. We don't have a federal shield law. We have state shield laws that allow reporters um, a certain amount of freedom. You know, we, d we don't have all the protections in place or the, I think, the spirit that some other countries do, and that's, it's very unfortunate. I mean, we should actually be the beacon for press rights throughout the world, and it's, I think, really sad that we're as low as we are. Anyone else? Well, I'm gonna ask one more question, follow okay. up on the coverage of diversity, and I'm wondering, you went through the experience of learning about a community in mm -hmm. a way you hadn't known before. Are there are other ways that journalists need to basically think about when covering women and people of color that mm -hmm. they have, are not doing now and could, in fact, increase people following them if they were including those communities. Yeah, so you know, one thing I am proud about uh, it, from my time in Buffalo is that I really diversified the newsroom. And the, the community, um, the city is about 40% African American. The overall community is something like 18% minority. And when I became editor, I, I was still able to hire pretty aggressively at that time. And I made sure that we, you know, had a newsroom that was reflected the community. And I also really tried to promote people of color into positions. You know, it's one thing to have people at the lower level. You know, you can say our numbers are good. But do you have assignment editors? Do you have editorial board members? You know, do you have ranking editors who represent that community? I think that's a Im really important part of doing a better job with coverage of communities, whether they be, um, you know, communities of color or other, you know, other minority communities. You need. It, I don't mean that you need to send. Uh, a Latino reporter out to cover a, an event that has to do with the Latino community. I, I'm not suggesting that. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have people in the newsroom who could say, you know, I'm editing this story and the way we're saying it is actually not great. I think, you know, once you have that in the newsroom, you're going to do a better job with covering diverse communities. And, and that has not been a strength. And now that we're in this situation of decline, the idea of diversifying newsrooms has unfortunately taken a back seat because we're grappling with mere survival. So it's, it's a hard thing to do both at once. Okay, so in closing, what's the last thing you would like to leave us with mm -hmm. that, or you wanted to strengthen your argument about in our talk? Sure, well, I mean, I guess I just would like to say that I think I have such a deep and strong feeling that journalism is an important part of our society. So I guess I would just ask all of you, whether you're students or members of the community or news consumers, whatever you may be, that when you hear, um, and you will hear, I'm sure you will, disparagement of the press, that maybe you, or when you find yourself, you know, wanting to do that yourself, that you might stop and think where we would be, I mean, where would we be in this moment in our country's history if if we didn't have reporters doing their jobs. So um, I guess that I would leave people with that. Okay. And thank you very much for well, having me. Well, thank you. Me.